please visit our website at www.ymsite.com. That's www.ymsite.com to learn more about our organization, Young Muslims, and its activities. For a complete listing of our products, please visit our online store at www.ymsite.biz. That's www.ymsite.biz. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آل أصحاب أجمعين ما dear brothers and sisters السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته it's a great honor for me to be here uh, Jersey City is historic but I've for whatever reason never actually come to Jersey City so I've never actually come to this masjid, but I've known about this. I'm uh, married to, um, uh, my wife is Egyptian, so her grandfather, when he first came here, settled actually in this area, Hajj uh, Muhammad Zenhom, and then his brother Anas Zenhom and Omar Zenhom, some of them are still in this area. So we know of Jersey City and, and New Jersey, but I never actually came here. So it's a pleasure coming here. I just finished uh, driving here from uh, Washington, D.C. That's why I apologize coming and joining you late. Um, inshallah for the next uh, about 15 minutes or so I wanted to set the stage for what we were trying to get accomplished today it's really a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he guides different people in the community to initiate programs that ultimately help this Muslim community here in North America to really take hold to really become steadfast in, it, in our religion and uh, young Muslims are to be commended for initiating this program called uh, Welcoming Ramadan uh, I know I've uh, watched it happen at least for the last year. Uh, it may have been uh, even more than that. But it's really a blessing uh, for us that... Uh, um, can, they, can you eat toothpaste when you pr- uh, passed? Is that the question? No. no? Um, oh. um, uh, uh, one of the sisters wanted to know a question that they can't ask Inshallah, Brother uh, Mazin will come back up for the questions, dear sisters, so do not fear, he's here. Uh, but he'll answer it after Isha, inshallah. Um, and, and also, I, to begin with, I, I'm not a scholar of Islam, I'm a student of Islam, so if you have any of those fiqh type questions, Brother Mazin and anybody else can do it. I'm, uh, I'm learning, so I'm not going to be handling it. But it is interesting, though, but the thing with the toothpaste, because it is true, it doesn't invalidate your fast if you don't eat the actual tube. So some people have a habit of going through the AIM toothpaste or crust or whatever and thinking it's not invalidating. So this, uh, our resolution this Ramadan. So to be clear, you always should know where the speaker is coming from. And in this case, resolution, really, if you want to look at it in an Islamic sense, resolution is referring to the niyyah, the intention with a plan. So everybody has to make a niyyah, the intention to fast, the intention to travel, the intention to study. But resolution would be to make that intention and then to put a plan behind it and then, and then bring it together to actually move forward. So we want to keep that in mind when we say, what is our resolution this Ramadan? I want to set the context for doing this. Because really, it's an amazing thing. If you watch Islam in America developing, it's amazing. As a, if I used to be one of those little boys playing in the back. I, I did. I mean, I, I was part of the, the MFL, the Muslim Football League in the Masjid. We were great. I mean, we used to get kicked out by the uncles every time. And, <laughs> and there was always that one uncle who squeezed your ear too hard. But we, we make the offer him as well. So the idea was that it's, it's developing so strong and so hard that new things are emerging in America. That America itself is familiar. The landscape is becoming familiar with Islam. And if you drive anywhere, you'll see, for example, here, the outside says Islamic Center. In other, massage, in other massages in other cities, you have the minaret, tall. And you, sometimes some of them are doing the adhan outside. So the landscape is becoming familiar with Islam. The psyche and the mindscape is not familiar with Islam. And there's a difference. You can physically put me with a dress that's different than, than the typical American dress. You can physically put me in a building that looks different than the typical American church or a synagogue or whatever. So you can see that there's a, there's a new people here. There are new people in this area. But the mind, the American mind has yet to really absorb what Islam is and really absorb who Muslims are. So in this context of fast, it's very, very challenging. Because as you know, if you've grown up in a, in a Muslim country, or uh, 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 I spent two years in Malaysia, it's a predominantly Muslim country. 
And you can tell the context is very different. The, every single thing about the society is centered around Ramadan. The radio programs inter, you know, interrupt at the, at the time of suhoor and at the time of uh, iftar with the adhan, an announcement, a dua. Right? There are things happening in the society that tell you, oh, it's Ramadan. You can't forget that it's Ramadan. Everyone is reminding you it's Ramadan. There are different you know, lectures about Ramadan. There are different uh, scholars coming through and, and leading the taraweeh prayers and beautiful recitations. It's all happening. Well, we are still developing that in America. So for the younger people, it's really hard to contemplate how am I going to really be a steadfast Muslim in an environment that's so antithetical to Islam. That in fact, if you watch TV, because about making resolutions, you're affected by what's around you. If I want to make a plan, but everything is against me, or seemingly against me, it's hard for me to think about that plan. And so if a young man or a young woman is struggling to make that resolution to fast, look what's around them. Everything around them tells them that your religion is not one of peace. Your religion is of violence. Your religion is of this or that. Or your people are terrorists, or you're this and that. And this person has to go to school, in high school, and fast daily. And then people say, you know, oh, what are you doing? They say, well, I'm fasting. And then they always ask that famous question, what do you do that, man? How do you do that? You don't eat for like a month? And then you look at them, you're like, and you don't think for like a month? Because if you think about it, you can ask me a question, what does fasting mean? Instead of asking me these kind of dumb questions. But they do that. And so it's challenging. And in, in fact, it's not just challenging. They're trying to cut out Islam from society. Trying to make it like, if you can do dhikr and, and, and basically, you know, just don't disturb the political landscape. Don't get too strong. Don't talk too much about politics. Don't talk too much about your rights. If you do that, we're going to shut you up. We're going to arrest your leaders. We're going to start, you know, really going after you. And so the kids are like watching this and listening to this and learning and then trying to make a resolution about how they'll approach Ramadan. And, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, knows this. He is Al-Hakim. He knows this. He's wise. He knows this. And he says in Surah As-Saf, he says this, that they'll try to put out the nur, the, the light of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, يُرِيدُونَ لِيُتْفِيُوا نُورَ اللَّهِ بِأَفْوَاهِهِمْ وَاللَّهُ مُتِمُّ نُورِهِ وَلَوْ كَرِهَ الْكَافِرُونَ That they will try with their mouths, with their lips, to put out, to blow out the light of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who perfects the light. And that's the encouragement with which we approach Islam every single day. SubhanAllah, perfected the light. Whoever did that, may Allah reward you. Right? So we approach Islam and, and, and the fasting with this re- resolve in our hearts that Allah has protected this religion. So now it's up to me really to take part in it. But in setting up this context, it's important to know that there are things happening around us that if we ignore it, then we'll become narrow-minded and treat Islam and the the fasting as just ritual worship. It's much more than this. And inshallah, I'll speak on three levels and I'll probably finish maybe one of those levels and then two of them I'll speak uh, on after the Salat al-Isha. So the three levels would be the, at the individual level. What is my individual resolution for this Ramadan? Then there is a collective family level. Islam is at all levels, so we can't just speak alone about myself. I have to see myself in a context of a family. If I'm married, I have a wife. If I have children, if I'm a son or a daughter of someone, I'm in a context of a family. Islam tells you that you don't just walk out there alone. Even the kunya of your father reminds him who his son is. Reminds who, who your father is. So the second level will be about the family. And inshallah, uh, uh, with enough time, we'll speak about the third level at the community level. What is our resolution to be this Ramadan? So to begin with, at the individual level, really the challenge and the goal is something very clear forward, very straightforward for us to know. And that comes out of the Qur'an. In many verses, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا إِتَّقُوا اللَّهِ Fear Allah. Fear Allah. Ittaqu Allah. Fear Allah. So at the individual level, everything about my resolution has to be in the context of the worship of Allah through a fear of Allah, but knowing that I have hope in the mercy of Allah. And the only thing that can emerge in all this, and those of you studying in, uh, in college or even in high school about personality, 
personality development. They'll talk about your identity, right? In Islam, your personality is essentially what? It's the taqwatic identity. It's the taqwatic personality. What is taqwatic? It's basically rooted in the word taqwa. The consciousness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that everything about you moving, walking, talking, in, in, in learning, everything about you is guided by this taqwa. So at the individual level, the resolutions are very clear. I have to resolve to first of all stop being a part-time Muslim. I have to make that resolution. It won't come automatically. Not in a society where the rest of the society is built around something that is antithetical to Islam. It, it separates man and woman from their essential nature of worshipping Allah and says separate the two. Separate church and state. Separate your life, your public life and your private life. To the extent that people can't even discuss religion because they're afraid that how am I going to discuss religion because I'm supposed to keep it private. And Islam is the exact opposite. Everything about me, whether I'm working or at home, whether I'm in the public or in the private, my identity, my individual resolution is to approach Allah with that God-fearing, with that taqwa that we're, we're, we're told about. And who bet, better to imitate? Who better to emulate than the personality of our beloved Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam? And his individual characteristics alone could fill volumes upon volumes to help us determine what our identity will ultimately be. So it doesn't have to be only about the physical manifestations. That's one aspect of it. What did he look like? How did he dress? How did he walk? He walked briskly. He walked as if he had a mission. He wanted to get somewhere. He was humble in his demeanor. That's just the physical aspect of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. But then he was also the best of creation. What made him the best of creation? As Ramadan approached, Aisha radiallahu anha tells us in Shaban, he increased his fasting. He increased. His, 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 his worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if you can imagine this, someone who is commanded in Surah Al-Muzammil to worship Allah for a third of the night or even more. Because the burden was about to be placed on him. What more can he do? Can a person like that do to increase worship? And yet it was possible. He increased not only in fasting, but he increased in his, his generosity, in his charitable act, in giving. This individual resolution was that this month is, just an, is not just another month. And the companions of the Prophet and the Salaf as the, the righteous predecessors, they used to actually make dua, Oh Allah, let me live until the next Ramadan. I mean, it's Shaban today, it's the last 10 days. How many of us have made that individual resolution? Oh Allah, not just take it for granted like, where will I be when the moon sighting is announced? How about, will I be alive when the moon sighting is announced? Will I be alive? That's the question to ask. And the companions used to make dua, Oh Allah, if I live through this Ramadan, I resolve, I do everything possible to help me, Oh Allah, live till the next Ramadan. Generosity is not just for those who have a job, by the way. This is something of a, of a fallacy that generosity means, you know, finances. So when we do a fundraiser, well, I can't give. So I don't know, I'm not really generous. No. Generosity comes from time. The use of your time. One of the five things the Prophet ﷺ talked about, taking advantage of five before five, of time before you become occupied. For those of you who are young right now, think about this. Think about this. You say you're busy, but really you're not. If you really look at it, you're not busy. You don't know busy until you study the life of the Prophet ﷺ. Imagine his life as a, as a public statesman, as a husband, as a father, as a community member, as a counselor. Imagine all of that. Imagine all of that. And that personality is one. It doesn't just emerge when Ramadan emerges and then leaves when Ramadan leaves. And that resolve has to come from all aspects, and I've spoken so far just about generosity and his uh, increase in ibadat. And inshallah, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll wrap up here and, uh, and, uh, and we'll pray Shah, and then I can continue for a little bit longer. But I do want you to know that you know, it's, it's okay to, have, to be a little bit like, lighthearted about what's happening with Muslims around you know, America in terms of Ramadan and other things about the masjid. 
And I'll share a few things with you as we close so that we don't always get so stressed and depressed that it's the masjid, oh, it's Islam, I have to be depressed and look really sad. No. In fact, I used to work at Isna when, and, uh, when I worked for a year there, the line I had, the telephone line, was the same line that they used for the official moon sighting. And believe it or not, subhanAllah, one time we got a call and I picked it up and said, Salaamu Alaikum, it was very late at night. And re- believe it or not, the, other, the voice on the other line said, Salaamu Alaikum, brother, is there a moon? <laughs> He was so excited about what to ask, he just asked, is there a moon? And I thought to myself, subhanAllah, yes, there's a moon, yeah. I don't know if it's there tonight, right? I don't know if it's available tonight, but yeah, there, there may be a moon. Another thing happened at Dar al-Hijra, the masjid I pray. And we're volunteering for Zakat al-Fitr, as Brother Mazin said, between 5 and $7, subhanAllah, how people do it. We were standing there, young people, we're just very excited, we're collecting... And we said, brothers, seven dollars, brothers, seven dollars. And, and one brother walks up and he goes, the imam down the street said five dollars. I, I said, okay, go, go pay and come back. I don't mind. I don't mind. You don't have to <coughs> pay me seven dollars. But this is happening. The different cultures are mixing. The different personalities are mixing. And Allah is testing. Testing those of us who want to be in America, to live in America, to see if we'll be really the people who participate in the in the steadfastness of establishing this religion, first in our lives, then in our families' lives, and then in the society around us. Resolution, as I see it, you talk about, you hear about it in the common culture, resolution, and it's uh, most commonly used with at the time of the new year. That's not what I'm suggesting Muslims should do, but it's the idea that something new is beginning. And we are saying that Ramadan is a reminder for us to return back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to try to make a resolution. And here we mean by resolution the niyyah, to make the intention and then to have a plan, inshallah, on how to complete the plan. I was speaking about generosity before I, uh, we stopped for the Salat al Isha. And one of the reminders we get from Imam al Shafi, uh, may Allah be pleased with him, he said once that it is beloved to me. To see one increasing his acts of generosity during the month of Ramadan, following the example of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and for one's own good, he said there are many who become overoccupied with fasting and prayers, forgetting the other benefits of the month of Ramadan, meaning here that uh, the, the the idea of being generous and and, and giving in uh, to to those in need. But I want to continue now with. Two other things about the resolution and inshallah as the brothers are those who are finished with praying sunnah if you would like to uh, stay with us if you could either inshallah move forward and, uh, and, and uh, join us or move to the back inshallah so that you're not uh, affecting the others who would like to listen so the second reminder about the individual level is that every single thing I do all days of the year, not just in Ramadan, has to be a reflection of this taqwatic personality or this, the God consciousness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So in Ramadan especially, in Ramadan especially, we talk about letting go of indecent speech. We talk about letting go of lying and of backbiting and of slander. And why is that important? Why does it become important? It, is, it rises in importance to a level that we are told that some of these things, when they happen, invalidate the fast. Invalidate the fast and then you have to seek tawbah from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to, for Him to really accept that you are genuinely interested in self-restraint. Well, what does that mean? Well, in America, where a majority of the people may not know that you're fasting, it's very possible that someone could upset you. It's possible that someone may, may offend you. It's possible that as, as little as you're in the line for the, the shopping and you're trying to buy the things for the iftar and someone in front of you cuts you off in line and, and they go in front of you or you're standing there and they keep pushing you with their shopping cart and you're getting frustrated and angry. Well, self-restraint. In Islam, self-restraint is to be there all the time. And if there's any da'wah to be done in this country... That Islam has to be known for its pure sense. It will come from every individual. Every single individual who when faced with this kind of ignorance or this kind of uh, provocation restrains himself or herself. And people say, what's wrong? I was really pushing your nerves. I was really pushing all the buttons. and I was, I, Anybody else would have blown up and gotten all upset. And you say what? You say, I'm fasting. 
So this part about about giving up these aspects of our of our if they exist in our personality becomes even more important in Ramadan. And the point I was making about da'wah is just that. Is that in America, people want to observe the Muslims. They want to see who the Muslims are. And if, well, I, I would want to ask some of the shuyukh, does it invalidate my fast? If I cut off someone in traffic, if I act rude to a non-Muslim, is it just Muslims? If my behavior is so unlike a Muslim, would that invalidate my fast? And you want to put different conditions and ask them why. Because we don't want to create a Muslim community that's a ghetto, that lives among itself and only preserves our values for ourselves. So I'm good to you if you're a Muslim, I'm rude to you if you're not. You know, walking around going, the kufar this and the kufar that. What kufar? What kufar? Today's kufar is tomorrow's Muslim if you have hope. If your personality is something that they would like to be imitating. If it's something that they want to come close to you and Ramadan is the best time to revive that personality that was given to us and the, the given to us by the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and he says in a in a hadith very clearly fasting is not merely abstaining from eating and drinking rather it is also abstaining from ignorant and indecent speech so if anyone abuses or behaves ignorantly with you then say simply to him or her i am fasting that I am fasting. Imagine that. Doesn't say, don't you know I'm so pious? You know, why aren't you as pious as I am? No, simply just say I am fasting. And close off that argument and walk away. Just walk away. It's not worth it for you to invalidate, to lessen the reward of getting of, of that fast, for you to speak uh, 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 loudly or even fa- uh, fight with that person. And again the Prophet ﷺ said that it, is, it may be that a fasting person receives nothing from his fast except hunger or thirst. It's happened to me. Sometimes I leave home early in the morning that I don't eat anything. Lunchtime comes by, I'm in class or I'm in meetings or this and that, I don't eat lunch. And then dinner times come by and I'm late getting home and sometimes it's after Maghrib. So it's maybe just like the brother Mazin said, just water or even if not water. But it wasn't fasting because fasting has in it a prerequisite of intention. So now suppose you make the intention at the beginning of Ramadan for that I will fast the entire month and then each day you make another intention. The Prophet is saying it could even then be that all you're doing is being hungry and thirsty because everything about you is anti, anti-fasting. We have da'wah and we have undawa. Some people do undawa. They undo the da'wah that the rest of the people are doing by the fact of who they are. By the fact of who they are. So if you behave that way, you'll be undoing the rewards of the fasting. And another hadith, and so much could go on, but these are just some that I chose that convey the meaning. So what is the reward of the individual trying to develop a personality grounded in taqwa? The Prophet ﷺ says that, I am a guarantor for a house on the outskirts of paradise. This is in Jannah, the Prophet ﷺ is saying, for whoever leaves off arguing, even if he is in the right, that I will guarantee you, you're talking about finances now and getting a loan for a house. The Prophet is saying, I'll guarantee your house on the outskirts of paradise if you don't argue, even if you're right. And there's an amazing culture developing in America where for sure it's happening the rest of the weekends, but in Ramadan it happens even more. You do taraweeh prayers, all your buddies are there, your friends are there. And, and everybody is there, and then what happens? Then you immediately say, well, let's do something else, you know, something more Islamic. So you watch a video of a lecture, and then someone says, you know, is that scholar right? And then, and then someone says he's not, and then you argue the whole night until suhoor, only to sleep the whole next day. And the Prophet is saying, even if you're right, leave off arguing, because in this case, I'm helping you, helping you to guarantee a house in paradise, on the outskirts of paradise. And then he says, And a house in the center of paradise for whosoever abandons falsehood even in joking. That is, I can't even lie just to make you laugh. I can't lie to make you laugh. It's not even allowed that you could lie. So he says, stay away from falsehood and that house would be in the center of, the, of Jannah. And then he says, And a house in the uppermost of paradise 
for whosoever makes his character good, akhlaq, his character. His character it comes from tarbiyah and the parents, and we'll talk about this as I, as I close with the, I mean, as I, as I go on to the family. So I'll stop there with that reminder about what the individual is attempting to do. The resolution is this, that you and I will resolve to determine and be determined to, to emerge with a personality that much closer matches the companions of the Prophet ﷺ and the characteristics of the life of the Prophet ﷺ. That's the taqwatic personality, the personality based in taqwa. The second element of this is that we have to make a resolution because Allah SWT says clearly in the Qur'an, Qu anfusakum wa ahlikum. That he doesn't just stop there. He doesn't, this is in Islam for people who are just, you know, about me, are just about me. So you get married and you say, brother, I don't ever really see your wife in the masjid or to the Islamic lectures or the conferences. I always see you, mashallah. Well, no, no, ya akhi, you know, she's taking care of the household. Taking care of the household? When will she ever learn? When will she ever learn then to teach the kids? When will she ever be exposed to the knowledge that you are being exposed to? So when you, Allah SWT is saying, anfusakum, Save yourself from this fire whose fuel is men and stones. He's also saying, Wa ahlikum, Your family must be saved. And our resolution has to be this Ramadan that we will not, we will not carry any more baggage at the end of the month of Ramadan that we brought into it even if we could not resolve it in the last 10 days of Shaban. What do I mean by that? There are many families for whom, for some reason, the relationship between the husband and the wife is strained. Very strained. They don't talk to each other. They don't talk to each other. They live in the same house, but they don't know each other. And believe me, I'm not making this up. I'm a social worker. I'm a counselor. We deal with these things. Of Muslims, not non-Muslims. You can't say, oh, the kufar, subhanAllah, they're all divorcing and America's going to hell. Yeah, if you keep speaking like that, you better, you're, you're completely asleep. You have no clue the divorce rate of the Muslim household, of how high it's rising. Because there is no resolution to keep the family together. So people are literally living in the same household, the husband and wife do not know each other. So the resolution has to be, even if it kills us, if it kills us, we will sit together and review some passage of the Qur'an that will be recited that night of taraweeh prayers. So you know it's a fairly straightforward system. The imam finishes so many parts of the Qur'an. Some do it faster, some do it slower. So you know what part is coming up. If he did two parts today, he's going to do part three tomorrow. That's the formula of taraweeh prayer. They're trying to finish the Qur'an as a blessing. So why not, before you come to the majlis, sit with your wife and see whatever tafsir we want to choose. If you can't... Read Arabic that well? Listen to the tafsir on cassettes. So, much, so many resources are there. But you have to have the niya, the intention. You can't just say, oh, inshallah, I intend to make my marriage better. But no plan. That's resolution. Intention plus the plan. So let's say we help improve, inshallah, the husband and the wife. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless all of the marriages, those even who are not yet married, to help them, inshallah, to have a good marriage. And for those who inshallah are married and are struggling to have a better marriage, and for those who have a good marriage, to have the best marriage inshallah. But then the second element of that family is the relationship between the mother and the father and the kids. And Ramadan is all about the kids. Believe me, if you haven't yet figured that out in America, Ramadan is all about the kids. It is they, it is they who must wake up against all odds before Fajr and rise and be all groggy and sleepy and tired and dad why are you doing this to me don't you want to let me to sleep and don't you love me that's the famous argument right don't you love me yeah I love you right, I used to do that to my dad I go don't you love me yeah so why are you waking me up for Fajr because <laughs> if you wake me up then I'm going to be all like tired and then I won't be do, do good in school and you don't you want me to get good grades and then you know they always said get good grades so he's always to go back to the grades but that's what's happening. Is that there are kids are just being left aside as if the mom and dad, Islam is about the mom and dad, if the mom and dad are doing it together. And if it's not, I say to you, you can build as many masajids as you want. But where will be the love in the hearts of those kids for Islam? Where will be the love for them to continue filling these rows of these masajids? Or will they lie hollow and then people will, Americans will go by and, and look and say like it's happening in Turkey. They'll say, yeah, that Islamic center on, on West Side Street... 
It's an amazing museum now. There used to be this community called the Muslims, the Muslims. Yeah, they were here and I don't know what happened to them. But their kids really, I guess they never woke them up for suhoor. <laughs> it's not that simple. Just waking them up for suhoor is not going to establish Islam in America. But it will establish Islam in their brains, in their minds, in their hearts. So they'll have a memory later on. We work on the campuses. For the Muslim Student Association, we have some kids who come to school, they have never been woken up by their parents for Fajr, forget Ramadan. And when they meet the MSA other members and the MSA people say, come on with us, we're waking up in the morning, we're waking up before Fajr, we're doing this, they get excited. Don't you want the kids now to get excited when they're young? And inshallah they'll transform that to the next level. And we learn from the Prophet ﷺ that his family meant a lot to him. A lot of the hadith narrated to us from his wife, Aisha radiallahu anha. She knew so much about his life. Why? Because she respected him beyond who he was as her husband. She loved him beyond who he was as her husband. The love that she had meant that she watched everything he did. Even when he didn't do something, she watched it. Why didn't he do this? And other companions watched it. Where is the love between the husband and the wife and the kids and the parents? That we want to watch and say, why does dad do this and this? Why doesn't he do this and this? Or are our kids so confused? That they go to these lectures and they come home and they say, man, I'm so depressed. One of the imams was saying a story about, it's a story, so you can take it for true or not. It's a story. He said, you know, two, two different stories. He said one time that a boy was crying on the way home from Juma prayer. And the mom and dad were very angry. They said, shut up, we're trying to talk. And he just kept crying and crying. And the more they said shut up, the more he cried. And they said, what's your problem? Tell us what's your problem. Why are you crying? And he said, the imam said that, that, that I should grow up in a Muslim household and I'm going to have to go back with you guys. <laughs> Imagine that. The khutbah, the imam said that every kid should grow up in a Muslim household and he's scared to death because when he goes home it's three hours of, of uh, you know, Egyptian or Indian movies and you know, the same plot again and again and he doesn't know when they're going to pray or if they're going to pray or anything. And the opposite story was what? Of a, the child of an imam, they say the story, where the child was like three years old and he broke a glass and the mother said, who did that? And he started running and he ran and ran and ran. Then he remembered in his head something which his dad always told him. Whenever dad was praying and he finished and the son was bothering him, he used to say, when somebody's praying, nobody can bother them, never. So the boy was running and running and the mother was chasing him. He went to the corner and he got himself in the corner. He doesn't know what to do. Allahu Akbar. <laughs> because for that minute, in his mind, it's ingrained. Salah is ingrained. The fitrah comes out from different aspects. And the family resolution has to be this Ramadan. That look, last Ramadan, we didn't do so well as a family. But this Ramadan, collectively we're going to try to finish the Qur'an. We're going to try to finish the Qur'an as a group. As a family and we'll rotate it. Why not? Believe me, the kids already know that because we do it when someone dies and then it's too late. Then it's too late. It doesn't benefit them. If they never did it while they were alive or they never knew that that's what they're supposed to do. And then in closing about the family, believe me, believe me, if one thing, one thing will help us advance in America, and again, I always go back to da'wah because that's why we're here. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has clearly said, وَمَنْ أَحْسَنْ قَوْلًا مِمَّنْ دَعَى إِلَى اللَّهِ وَعَمِلَ الصَّالِحًا وَقَالَ إِنَّنِي مِنَ الْمُسْلِمِينَ Who is better than the one who calls people to Allah? Does good deeds and says, Indeed, I am one of the Muslims. If your family, if my family is together, and you go to work, and the guy next to you who is not a Muslim and is constantly depressed and constantly, you know, like in, 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 a, in, a, in, a, in a stressful uh, circumstances. And then he says, what about you, man? Don't you have problems in your marriage? He said, yeah, I have problems in my marriage. But then I have the guidance of the Qur'an. I have the guidance of the Prophet Muhammad wasallam. I have the masjid that I can go to for social support. I have people who are trained in the masjid. Imagine what kind of an, in, what kind of an impression that leaves on the people. What kind of an impression does it leave? It leaves the impression that, hey, maybe Islam has the solution. We used to talk here about our, our, our ancestors talking about, Islam has the solution, Islam has the solution. They say, brother, what's going on with you? My wife is going to ask me for divorce because I'm not at home because I'm always talking outside about Islam is the solution. 
Right? Islam is a solution, but it's not a bumper sticker, it's not a t-shirt. Islam is a solution if you live it, and the family has to start living it. And I'll close, inshallah, with the reminder about the community. And we, and we really, now more than ever, not only in the Muslim community in America, in the inner city of America, and in the suburbs of America, but also in the international community, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will ask us, when I gave you the freedom of living in a country whose constitution said that you have the freedom of religion, so that you were not bothered, no one was bothering you, what did you do for Islam? What did you do for the people of other faith? And the community obligations are tremendous, are tremendous. And as Ramadan comes up, the community obligations will increase and increase and increase to the extent that people will look at you and say, really, what do you guys benefit for America? You take everything from us. You are immigrants or you're this and that. All you do is take, take, take. What do you give to America? And I say to you, the resolution for Muslims in America, this Ramadan has to be about outreach to those Muslims who are silent majority and just living out there. You only see them in the, in the halal meat stores and the spice stores and the movie stores. You never see them in the masjid. That's outreach to them first and then outreach to the people of other faith. That has to happen. It's happening on the campuses where the, after talking to the scholars, the students devised a, a beautiful program called the Fastathon. And they actually go and they tell their non-Muslims, the faculty, the staff, the student, they say, you know, about a marathon? They said, yeah, I've done marathons where I ran for five miles. And they said, I'll give you $10 for every mile you run. And it goes to some charity. Well, what do these Muslim students say? Well, guess what? How about, why don't you join me and fast for one day? Get hungry for change. So if you fast, the Muslim businesses are willing to give $10 for everyone who fasts. And where is that money going to go to? Even if you raise $1,000, it will go to the food bank. $1,000, it will go to the New Jer- Jersey City food bank. $1,000 to the uh, soup kitchen. $1,000 to the homeless shelter. Where is it from? The Islamic center on West Side Street. Where is it from? It's from the Muslim students. It's from the young Muslim group. And then people say, man... Everything I hear on TV, that's, that doesn't fit with those Muslims who came to the shelter last week. They were so soft. And there are women who were wearing the hijab and the jilbab and fully covered. They were like so, you know, uh, I mean, uh, assertive in their personality. They, they're, some of them are studying, some of them are at home. But they're not that, that woman that we know about who's backward and who doesn't know anything. Yeah, they came to our, our, our shelter and they served, they served soup to our, our people. And that's just the outreach. And we have to start there. Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah, may Allah be pleased with him, said this, that the welfare of the people will not be complete neither in this world nor in the akhirah except with three things. With ijtima', with collectiveness, with ta'awun, with cooperation, with tanassur, with mutual help. And believe me, all of us are being called upon to do that. A, body of our, a part of our body is hurting. In Gaza, in the West Bank, we're living in a time where refugees in Kosovo are still refugees, in Chechnya are still refugees, in Kashmir are still struggling, in, on the border of Afghanistan and Pakistan are still struggling. But I don't say all this so you go home and say, oh my God, that guy came, that came from D.C., he depressed me so much. The Muslim world is just full of depression. No, I say this so that you make a resolution. What would you say? How do you make ijtima? How do you make collectiveness? By knowing. By knowing who they are. Who are these people that are suffering? What is the inner city like? Where is the inner city masjid? Let me go there. Where is the suburban masjid that's only open between 10 and 2? On Sundays between 10 and 2? Let me go there and ask them, what do you do? How are you? Ijtima, collectiveness will only come from getting to know each other first of all. And then the next level is ta'awun, cooperation. And cooperation has to come on different levels. So to get to know, I must at least specialize. If I wanted to study the young people in the inner city, then that's my goal. If I want to study the refugee children in the camps, that's my goal. If I want to study women, that's my goal. I want to study the education of women, that's my goal. If I want to study the political system, that's my goal. But I have to specialize. If none of us specialize, what's going to happen is all of us will be constantly upset that nobody is doing anything. 
But if you specialize 20 years from now, as Sheikh Yusuf al qaradawi said, specialize, specialize. Why? So 20 years from now, you can look back and say, Subhanallah, Amr and Abdullah and Aisha, those are the people that we go to for social services in Islam. They know everything about social services according to the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet And you go to Mazin and you go to Abdullah and you go to, to, to uh, Imran. Why? Because they know everything about financial transactions in Islam. They specialize. And you go to so-and-so and you say, why? Because they specialized in Arabic language. And you go to so-and-so and they specialize in fiqh. And then something may start to happen. Something may start to happen. And this community really, if we really understand it, then the Prophet ﷺ said this about the community and, and the resolution kind of goes into this and I'll close. Then he said, the most beloved of people to Allah are those who are of most benefit to them, are most useful to the people. How useful are we? He doesn't say in that the most beloved people to Allah are those Muslims who are useful to people around them. No. He says the most beloved of people are those who are, be- are of most benefit to those around them. Most useful. How useful is this community in America to the Americans? How useful are we to them? Wouldn't it be amazing if 20 years from now you had social services, counseling, where non-Muslims were lining up in the counseling saying, man, that guy, that imam, or that scholar of theirs is saving marriages. Their son ran away and he brought them back together. Their daughter was dating and he brought them back. Something about that imam, he, he knows so much. I'm not even a Muslim, but he speaks in a language that's beautiful, it touches our hearts. When will that happen? When you have a model that they want to imitate. When you have a model that they can look at. If they only know of this masjid, as whenever they gather, we have a parking problem. Right? Whenever those Muslims get together, we have a parking problem. Right? The black Honda in front of the garage, the black Honda on top of the Lincoln, the Lincoln on top of the Cadillac. You know, I don't know how we do it, but we do it. We park on top of cars. I don't know how we're doing this, but we're doing it. And imagine what the impression is outside. Imagine what the impression is. Say, well, I don't know if I want to be a Muslim because I don't think I can park on top of another car. It's an exaggerated example. I don't think anybody is doing that. I'm just telling you. Right? We have masjid who is actually having to pay a towing company to come and tow any, anywhere. I've seen it in Michigan and Virginia. Tow the cars of other Muslims because they refuse to follow the system of the community. The system of the community is please park in where there's a parking spot. Not inside the masjid. Right? <laughs> that's community. That's building. And again, I close with saying that these three levels of operation are not new. The Quran talks about this all the time. You're, you're accountable for who you are through muhasaba, for what you do. You're accountable for your family. anfusikum wa ahlikum. And you're responsible for the community. Inna hadihi ummatukum ummatan wahida. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is this is indeed your community, your one community. And then he continues in another verse. Wa atasimu bi hablillahi jamia wa la tafarraku. And hold on tight. Hold on tight to this community and do not be divided. Do not be divided. And so the resolution at the community level should be what? Is let us bring back those brothers and sisters who have left the masjid for some reason or the other. They got angry, someone got them upset. Their wife never used to come, she came and some sister said, what kind of a Muslim are you, you don't cover? And she's like, I haven't even been to the masjid in 10 years, give me a break. Right? Or some, somebody's boy came in and he wanted to pray and he had a gold chain and somebody yanked the gold chain off and now he got hurt and he's upset that some uncle who didn't even know him pulled the gold chain off. Why? Because men aren't supposed to wear gold and this boy came to the masjid even though he was drinking and dating and doing all this haram and finally he started coming to the masjid and the first thing they did was rip off the, the chain off of his neck. Where is the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ? Where is the rahmah of the, of the, of the beloved Muhammad ﷺ? Where is the progressive learning and the thinking of the community? Where is all of this? And the only thing we can say is Ramadan of all other months is a reminder. Because that is the month in which the Quran was revealed. That is the month in which the Prophet ﷺ gave not only his generosity of his time, of his energy, of his money. That is the time when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has guaranteed maghfirah for us. He's guaranteed maghfirah for us. And so our resolution has to be really that we want to go into Ramadan a little bit eager, eager about the blessings that are waiting us. And we want to come out of Ramadan with the resolution that, Oh Allah, 
O oh Allah, let me sincerely live until the next Ramadan. So that if I live until the next Ramadan, I'll be a benef- beneficiary of the blessings that you have outlined for us. Of the blessing that you have outlined for us. And really, no more reminder can come be- as beautifully as going back and reading the seerah of the Prophet wasallam. What were his habits like in Ramadan? What did he do that I want to do? This is not just for men only, for women as well. What did his wives do? What were their traditions? And for the kids. And we have to really, when Ramadan, inshallah, as the estimates go, it may most likely be around the week of the Thanksgiving break. So you know that, it's not a surprise, it's about 30 days. So if it starts 25th, 26th, 24th, whatever of October, it will end in about 29 or 30 days. Surely you could ask for a vacation day or two and make that resolution and say, I'm going to make a plan so that the break I officially get for Thanksgiving, I'm going to move it up a day or two. So the last two or three nights of Ramadan, I'm going to be working on myself, I'm going to be working on my family, and definitely I'm going to be trying to work on the community. At the end of Ramadan, I have two, feel, two thoughts I always have. I feel very lonely at the end of every Ramadan. Because in Ramadan you feel like a, like a brotherhood, sisterhood. People you never saw coming. People coming and eating iftar and gathering and praying taraweeh prayers. And then suddenly the masjid walls must feel so lonely. And everybody is gone. And then the Quran itself must feel so lonely. Because for some reason, we treat it as a library system where we only check it out during Ramadan. We only check it out and open it during Ramadan. And then we promptly return it back on the shelves at the end of Ramadan. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told us in the Quran that the Prophet ﷺ will complain, will complain upon us, saying that we had abandoned the Quran. Ya Rabbi, inna qawmi ittaqadu hada Quran mahjura. That, O oh Lord, O oh my Lord, that indeed my ummah, my people, had abandoned, had abandoned this Quran. And Ramadan is not only a time to get physically back in touch with the Quran, reading it, but really, really trying to aspire to help our families understand it, and inshallah our communities understand it. Wa jazakumullahu khairan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Please visit our website at www.ymsite.com. That's www.ymsite.com to learn more about our organization, Young Muslims, and its activities. For a complete listing of our products, please visit our online store at www.ymsite.biz. That's www.ymsite.biz.